Okay, welcome. Welcome. All right. Um, some of you did move up, and so I just want you to know that um, you're my favorite people. And those of you at the back, we'll see how I feel. Okay, um, welcome to the Hedges Lecture. I realize that some of you are new to SRI or you haven't been at a SRI conference in a while, so I'm gonna begin by telling you a little bit about the Hedges Lecture. It's an annual lecture that has been presented at SRI since 2016. The lecture is named for Larry Hedges to honor his work developing statistical methods, advocating for rigorous research in education and the social sciences, and providing foundational leadership to SRI. The award is meant to provide an outlet for us as a SRI community to honor the central role that methodological development plays in improving research. Previous Hedges lectures have been given by Esther Duflo, Andrew Gelman, Judy Singer, Steve Roudenbush, David Francis, and Barbara Schneider. Quite an illustrious group. With this in mind, I am excited to introduce the 2023 Hedges lecturer, um, Professor Rod Little. Rod is the Richard D. Remington Distinguished University Professor of Biostatistics and a Professor of Statistics at the University of Michigan where he is also a research professor in the Institute for Social Research. He's an elected member of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, the National Academy of Medicine, the American Statistical Association, and the Royal Statistical Society. I'm particularly excited to have Rod here with us at SRI because of his contributions to both survey sampling and causal inference. Far too often, researchers receive training in either sampling or causal inference, but not both. I would actually bet that most of you in this room have had a class in experimental design or causal inference, but I would also bet that far fewer of you have had a class in survey sampling. This is rather unfortunate since it's methods for sampling that bring questions regarding populations, the recruitment of participants, and the use of statistics for decision making to the fore all questions that I know we all contend with every day. Rod is most well known for his contributions to methods for handling missing data. In 1987, with Don Rubin, he authored the foundational book, Statistical Analysis with Missing Data, with updates in 2002 and 2019. To date, this book has over 34,000 citations. The book brought us taxonomies and terminology. MAR, MCAR, NMAR, and methods including multiple imputation that are now familiar to us and we often use in many of our analyses. Today, Rod will talk to us about the treatment of missing data in empirical studies and education. I know from conversations with many of you that missing data is a very real and pressing concern as you try to salvage studies interrupted by the pandemic. But I also know that this problem is more general, that particularly when studying under-resourced schools and historically excluded populations, attrition can be what keeps an otherwise strong study from being considered so. For this reason, how we handle missing data isn't just a question of statistical detail. It has real impact for our understanding of what works and how we can work to improve education. Um, Please join me in welcoming our 2023 Hedges Lecturer, um, Professor Rod Little. Before I step away, I want to do a little bit of housekeeping, which is to say, we have decided that you will not be allowed to stand up to ask questions, so I was kind of lying about calling on you. Um, <laughs> you're gonna have to write your questions on these on the pieces of paper, the brown pieces of paper, and then hold them up in the air, and somebody from the staff will come grab one, um, and then bring them to Liz Stewart or myself, and we will take turns asking questions on your behalf at the end. We think this will be more productive than us kind of pushing our way through this room. Um, so without further ado, here is Rod Little. So thank you very much. Uh, where's the clicker? Oh, hi. It's in my pocket. <laughs> That's what happens when you get to be my age. So. <laughs> <laughs> 
Um, so, uh, thank you very much. Thank you to the committee for inviting me. It's a real honor to do the Larry Hedges lecture. I, Larry and I go back a long time. I think we were both on the NAEP committee about 100 years ago. Well, not quite 100, but getting that way. And uh, you know, we all know that Larry is a fantastic statistician. He's extremely productive. Um, he has more citations than I do. And, uh, <laughs> and he's just a terrific guy as well. So it's really a, a great pleasure. Um, so I'm going to talk a bit about missing data. And uh, I'll have a little bit of an educational piece to it. Um, here's, here's an outline of the talk. So first, I'm going to define what missing data, what it means for me. I think it's good to have a definition. Um, talk a bit about missingness mechanisms. Beth had mentioned MAR, MCAR. I'll say a little bit about that. <clears throat> what makes a good property, or what makes a good missing data method? And uh, I have a little bit of an educational context. So I was looking, they, the, the committee sent me the works, What Works Clearinghouse that has uh, um, things to say about missing data. And I'll, I'll sort of use that as a little bit of a backdrop make a few comments about uh, their approach to the missing data problem. <clears throat> then I'm going to talk about main approaches, and maximum likelihood Bayesian methods, <clears throat> complete case analysis, throw out the cases that have any missing values, weighting the complete cases, multiple imputation, which uh, Beth mentioned, and then uh, some, a little bit about robust approaches to, to uh, missing data, and then how to deal with the thorny issue of missing not at random, which uh, um, is not an easy issue, as I'll discuss. <clears throat> there are a lot of books on missing data. So you're very kind to mention my, my book with uh, Don Rubin. The third edition came out in 2019. And, and quite a lot of the material sort of comes a little bit from that book. Um, but there's a bunch of other books which I'm listening here, which are, are good reading and have good things to say about the subject. So it's really uh, evolved quite a bit from uh, the old days. Um, the material I'm going to talk about here, some of it comes from my, my book, the, but then I have a, a paper that talks about uh, complete case analysis, weighting, and multiple imputation um, with uh, Carpenter and Lee, which uh, came out in sociological methodology. And uh, then I have a paper coming out in annual reviews of, of clinical psychology that uh, has more information. <clears throat> so we have a data matrix. We have some the rows of the cases, the columns of the variables, and we have gaps in them. Now, this, this general pattern sometimes is called Swiss cheese because it's like you have holes in the Swiss cheese. So, um, so, so what makes it missing data? Well, if, if filled in, would that value be meaningful for analysis? I think that's the right question to ask when you're thinking about what, whether it's missing data or not. So if it was, if, would it be meaningful if, for analysis if it was observed? So it's not always totally obvious. So if you have a missed clinical visit or a missed education visit in, in an education setting, somebody didn't show up for school for one reason or another, but then you're asking them things about education, presumably there's a, there's a real value um, un, that's missed there that has meaning. Um, on the other hand, if you're doing a study, for example, of quality of life, and then you have people who unfortunately die, does it make sense to talk about quality of life for people who have died? I would say the answer is probably no in most settings. And so that's not missing data from my point of view. So I, it's worth, sometimes it's not clear, and it's worth asking the question, I think. <clears throat> There's the pattern of missing data. So there are methods that have been developed for, for special patterns of missing data, like this is the first one. Oh, I think I could do it, even perhaps do this. How does that work? Oh, yes. I can't do it both, both sides at the same time. <laughs> <laughs> well, all right, I'll, 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 I'll alternate. So, oop, I went the wrong way. OK, so this is univariate missing data. I have missing data on one variable. Um, and then a bunch of others that are fully observed, or you can have a bunch of variables that are, are missing for the same pattern. That sort of happens in, in, in unit non-response in surveys, for example, where the, the, y, the, the Ys that are missing are the survey variables and they're missing for everybody. They didn't bother to do the questionnaire. Um, in a longitudinal setting, you could have, um, as you go across, 
more and more people drop out. So that's like a, a, a dropout pattern. Often in longitudinal studies, the pattern is predominantly um, monotone. Uh, and then you just have a general pattern. And it's one of the things that's good is that I, now we have a lot of methods for handling general patterns of missing data. So we can deal with a pattern where, where you really have the Swiss cheese. Yeah. Um, the file matching thing is kind of interesting. If you put together two data sets, they have some variables in common and some variables that are, uh, are unique to each survey, then you get a pattern like that. And uh, it's worth looking at the pattern because here, for example, the parameters of association between Y2 and Y3, or partial association, are not going to be easy to estimate because we have no information about them. So it's worth knowing that, I think. Then there's the mechanism. Um, that in particular, why are things missing? And is the re are the reasons related to the variables in the study? And this is where Rubin's terminology come in, comes in about missing at random and so on. So I'll go over here. I can't see over there, it's too far. So, so let's suppose we have a data matrix, and let's say D, D0, this is kind of an informal notation, but D0 are the observed values, so zero stands for observed. D1 is missing values um, in the matrix. And, um, and then you have a missing data indicator, sometimes I use response indicators, which are whether you respond or not. This is the same thing, but it's whether you're missing or not. So it's one minus response. Just indicates which values are missing and which values are observed. Then missing at random says that, uh, let's see if I can do it. Missing at random says that missingness doesn't depend on the data, essentially. Rubin uses the term dart throwing. I don't know if that's a great analogy, but that's what he uses. Um, and then, uh, so, that, so that's kind of a strong assumption. Sometimes you have design missing data where that's reasonable, but, but in a lot of other settings, probably not very reasonable. Um, and then uh, missing at random where missingness depends on the observed variables, D0, but, but conditional on those observed variables doesn't depend on the missing variables. So it depends on stuff you, you have observed, but not on stuff that you don't have observed, roughly speaking. And then missing not at random, where missing this depends on the stuff that's uh, not observed. Um, let's see. Oop. I don't want to do that. Go back. So um, missing at random plays a strong role in, in, in the uh, performance of uh, missing methods for handling missing data. Uh, and one of the problems is that many of the methods, so if you look at software out there, a lot of them assume missing at random. But the trouble is you don't really know in any real problem whether you have missing at random or not. You can't really test missing at random without making some supplemental uh, assumptions that uh, you may not want to make. So that's one of the sort of challenges that going beyond missing at random is uh, hard to determine whether you need to, and then it's a little bit hard to know what to do once you're missing not at random. I'll give some advice at the end. So what's a, what are the properties of a good missing data method? Well, it really the idea is to make efficient use of the available information you've got. Um, not so much to fit, to necessarily to fill in the missing values, although imputation is one way of doing this, but it's more making use of the observed data you have in each case then it needs to be based on plausible assumptions. And one of the themes I'm going to say is that you can't get it. There's no such thing as an assumption-free analysis when you have missing data. Just about any analysis makes some assumption about missing data, which is one of the reasons why it's probably better not to have missing data. I'll talk about that later. Um, and then provides valid inferences. Uh, in particular, inferences, what do I mean by an inference? I mean a confidence interval or hypothesis test, a p-value, if you like, that, that takes into account the missing data uncertainty. So if you were to impute everything, then you're sort of making stuff up. And if you're making stuff up, then you're, you're overestimating the precision. So the confidence interval is going to be too narrow, for example. So you need a method that de deals with the missingness uncertainty. Uh, and... Um, what I'm, it had, you should have confidence interval coverage that at least under the assumptions of the method um, has nominal coverage. And uh, you know, the hypothesis test have to have nominal size. So it's a 5% test, it should have a 
roughly 5% size. And then exploits information contained in the incomplete cases for inference of the, about the parameters you're interested in. Um, so the goal is not necessarily to get the best predictions of the missing values. There's a lot of sort of machine learning stuff out there where the goal is really to predict the stuff that's missing. And that, that's sometimes just the right thing to do. That's sometimes what we're interested in. But from point of view of statistical inference, that's not the goal. The goal is to get, them, is to get a good inference. So that, that's, a, that's a good method. And then for the context, um, I think a lot of you probably know something about the What Works Clearinghouse from the Department of Education, I think. Um, this is, uh, I, I, I took a look through the Procedures and Standards Handbook version 5, that was what was sent to me. Reviews relevant research, identifies well-designed and well-implemented impact studies, summarizes findings, and disseminates them, essentially. So uh, the goal is to help educators, etc., to make evidence-based decisions. Sounds good idea. And, and the WWC, I, I keep on forgetting Clearinghouse, so it's hard to remember what C stands for. I can't. So I'll probably just call it WWC, if you don't mind. Um, it's good to have standards. Um, and... Uh, um, so the idea is to refine its procedures and standards based on improvements in education research, research synthesis. This is from the uh, handbook. So it's good to have standards. It's not very easy to create them. It's a difficult job. These uh, guidelines are really quite sophisticated, I would say. And uh, they're trying very hard to, uh, to, to uh, provide good advice. And there are a lot of good things here. I, mean, I should say that they refer to one of my methods at, a, at one point. So that if they do that, it has to be a very good method of thing. <laughs> but I will have a few things that are sort of perhaps could be construed as being criticism. So um, it's not all. So, so that makes, perhaps makes it a little bit more interesting. <clears throat> um, just a general comment. One thing that bothered me a bit when I read this thing was it it mentions statistical significance 53 times. Um, and uh, this is perhaps a, a little bit of a, a leftover from the past. You know, the American Statistical Association has statements about p-values and hypothesis testing and uh, talks a lot about the limitations. And I would say that the goal should be to promote strong studies that provide useful evidence, not to give statistical significance. So statistical significance is not the, uh, the, go, the gold standard for a good study. And that's one of the things that why perhaps we have the crisis of replication. So this is kind of a general comment. So I would perhaps focus a little bit more on inf inference rather than the, the, the term significance. Um, another thing that bothered me a little bit, so this is causal inference, the, the, which, which is great. And uh, there's a compiler average causal effect. And there's some sophisticated methods for handling the compiler average causal effect. I didn't like the definition of, 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 of the SACE very much. The, uh, the manual says it makes the average effect of taking up the intervention among compliers, that is those who take up the intervention if assigned to the intervention, intervention as well as those who would take up the intervention if assigned the comparison condition. That is not the right definition of the SACE. And I would suggest Instead of saying, as well as those, I would say, and, because the point about the SACE is you have to comply with both the conditions if you're assigned to them. And that's not what's said there, so just a, a minor editorial comment. <laughs> okay, so I, I'll come back to the, 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 the more missing data aspects of this a bit later, but let me now sort of just talk about general methods for handling missing data. Um, starting with uh, maximum likelihood. Well, there's three general, I like to divide different methods into three sort of buckets. So there's uh, complete case analysis, the one in the middle, where you basically throw out all the cases that have any missing values, um, and then uh, just analyze the complete cases. There's, there's available case analysis, which allows for different sets of cases depending on the analysis, depending on which variables you're measuring or there's complete case analysis, which applies it to, the, to any, something that's missing, that's observed all the variables you're analyzing. 
and, uh, and a bit of a case analysis is making more use of the data, but it has some, some downsides in terms of having different sets of cases being used for different analyses, and that can get you into trouble. So both of these have pros and cons, I would say. I'm going to talk a little bit about complete case analysis uh, when, I, when I think it's a good method and when it's not such a good method. Then uh, on, on the left, can we go over here? Oh, I just pressed the wrong button. Sorry about that. This is uh, imputation, so you can fill in the missing data. I, I think you should do multiple imputation, I'll say why later. But uh, that has the advantage that you're not throwing anything away, but it has the disadvantage of making stuff up, which uh, <laughs> some people don't like. Um, and then the third thing is that there are some methods based on the likelihood function that don't really require a rectangular data set. So you can basically generate a likelihood function and then do a likelihood-based method. Uh, like maximum likelihood or Bayes, those, those are two. Also multiple imputation sort of based on that too, as we'll see. Well, this is what WWC says about this. First step in the review process for studies with missing data is to determine whether an acceptable approach was used to address missing data. Acceptable cases include complete case analysis, regression imputation, dummy imputation, maximum likelihood, and non-response weighting. Okay, I'll talk about a number of those things. There's one method to me that is missing from this. Um, oop, what happened? I can't do this. Uh, there's no Bayes, and I like Bayes. <laughs> and I'll tell you a bit about Bayes in a minute. So, but anyway, um, they talk about regression imputation, right? So re now, they use regression imputation to mean also multiple imputation. Um, and, uh, but the usual way I think regression imputation is used is where you're plugging in the best estimate of the missing value. So it's like you do a regression and then you plug in the best estimate from the, from the regression. Um, so you're plugging in a, a, a conditional mean, essentially, from a statistical point of view. Whereas in multiple imputation, you're, you're doing a draw from the distribution. And, uh, so uh, those are two different approaches, and uh, I like the imputing draws, um, doing it, but doing it multiply, as, well, as I'll say. Um, so I'll talk a bit about um, the uh, multiple imputation, which I like. I think it's, uh, I recommend it. And in particular, I like uh, what, what's known as chained equation or sequential regression imputation. Um, and I'll say why, I'll say a little bit more about this method later, but one reason I like it is it handles a general missingness pattern, so you can deal with missing data all over the place. Um, it's very flexible, and um, it gives you valid standard errors if you have good models. So you have to get the model right, or roughly right, but otherwise it, it does propagate the imputation error. Um, WWC says the imputation model must include the outcome when imputing the missing baseline data. So you have baseline data that's missing, and then you have, say, uh, an, out, uh, an, an outcome variable later, and then it says that you, when you're imputing the baseline data, you should condition on the outcome data. Well, that's true if you're imputing a draw, but it's wrong if you're imputing a mean, which is what regression imputation is usually understood to be. So this is, to me, not quite right. Um, it's not, uh, it gives you biased estimate if you, if you impute conditional on the outcome and you plug in a mean. And I have a paper back in 1992 that talks about that. Then there's dummy imputation, a method which I don't love. So um, this, in, this says you have an indicator of whether you're missing or not, and then you include the indicator in there um, in somehow as part of the regression model. And there's been work that shows that if you if you include the indicators, the M's, if you like, um, in the imputation, in the analysis model, that corresponds to a model that usually doesn't make much sense. And there's a couple of papers that I referenced there. If you use it as part of a, an imputation model, that then you, you do the analysis model without including the indicators, it has more promise, but it is still making an assumption, it's actually a missing not a random assumption, which is discussed a little bit in the paper. I have references in the back, by the way, and make the slides. So. 
In general, I'm not a big fan of dummy variable imputation, although as part of an imputation model, it, it could have some good features. Okay, and then maximum likelihood, as I said, that's good. I like maximum likelihood, um, but why not Bayes? So um, I'm gonna talk a little bit about likelihood-based methods in general next. So um, what, what's a likelihood? Well, you generally have a statistical model for the data, and uh, then you have data, and then you generate the likelihood. The likelihood is basically just the density of the observed data, but treat where the argument is the parameters rather than the data. It's kind of technical. Actually, I give a talk about history of statistics, and my first talk is, is uh, Fisher's 1922 paper on maximum likelihood, which is an incredible paper. So you know it, right? But, so he, where he defines likelihood functions. Anyway, um, to do this, in general, you need a statistical model for the data, and, and, and generally you need a model for, for the data, the Y, no, the D I was talking about before, but also a model for M. So you need a model for D and M in general. But then Rubin in 76, in his famous paper, showed that the missingness mechanism is not needed if it's missing at random, essentially. So missing, there's also a distinctness condition, which to me is more technical. The important one is missing at random. So the main point here is if you're missing at random, missingness only depends on the observed variables, then uh, you don't need to model the missingness mechanism. And that's, a, that's nice because it's very hard to model the missingness mechanism. If you're missing not at random, then formulating a model for the joint distribution of D and M is tricky. And if you get it wrong, then you can get the wrong answer. And it's problems with identifying the parameters, so on. <clears throat> well, maximum likelihood has, likelihood has lots of great properties. Um, it's consistent and efficient. This actually goes back to Fisher's 1922 paper, over, to, over 100 years old, um, if you have the model right. So you have to kind of assume you have a, a model. Um, and then you can get standard errors that take into account the missing data. So you can use information matrices or, or bootstrap, something like that. Um, now, th there are three general missing data pro approaches based on, on the likelihood. There's maximum likelihood, um, where you maximize the likelihood. I guess that's why it's called maximum likelihood. Seems like a logical term. Um, and then you get large sample standard errors. And that has great properties if you've got, if you've got a lot of data. So if you have a large data set, it, 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 it works pretty well. Um, Bayes inference, you add a prior distribution and base things on the posterior distribution. So Bayes' theorem is basically posterior is proportional to prior times likelihood. So if you, have a, if you have an incomplete data likelihood, you can just add a prior to the thing. Um, and uh, the thing about Bayes is if, if, if you have small samples, I think Bayes is better than maximum likelihood. Um, and uh, then there's multiple imputation. Multiple imputation is really a simulation approximation to Bayes, at least one, the main variant of it is. And uh, so multiple imputation can be viewed as being a simulation approximation to Bayes, actually. <clears throat> There's a lot of applications, um, a lot of them in, in repeated measure settings. So I'm sure a lot of you have studies of repeated measures use MMRM, the normal mixed model, random effects model. There's a lot of software and SAS, different areas. Everybody can find a software package to do this under missing at random. So that's a big area. Um, I suspect it's common in the w to WC context. And it's okay if you have a lot of data and if you're missing at random, and then you have to have a, a decent model. The uh, extensions are all, also extensions to non-normal data, generalized linear mixed models. Um, the, this software generally doesn't handle missing covariates like baseline variables. Um, one possibility is to fill them in using multiple imputation and then apply the method multiply to the data sets. Um, and then uh, there's M plus. I'm sure some of you probably use M plus, which is uh, popular in the uh, uh, structural modeling, structural equation modeling literature. Um, and, uh, and then there's a lot of nice multivariate models where you can do maximum likelihood. Um, I, I mentioned here the, the book by Ray Peskis and Scrondahl, which has, uh, shows a lot of more general models. 
So this is, a, this is an important applied method, and uh, at least if you're missing at random and you have enough data, I think it's a reasonable method. Bayesian methods, you had a prior, um, and Bayesian methods have become much more feasible, as probably a lot of you know, using Markov chain Monte Carlo methods, where you do draws from the predicted distribution of the parameters. Methods like the Gibbs sampler. Actually, one of the first applications of the Gibbs sampler was to missing data, a paper by Tanner and Wong in the 1980s. They called it data augmentation, but uh, it was basically a Gibbs sampler. Um, and then there's a lot of software for doing Bayes inference, and that you can use, use that software if you're clever to deal with the missing data as well. Um, such as and SAS has a proc, MCMC, STAN, which is uh, Andy Gelman's a package, JASP, and a bunch of other software. So it's much easier to do it in terms of software these days. So Enders, uh, in a recent review paper, said that Bayes is an attractive direct estimation competitor to ML. And my own view is that ML is marvelous, but Bayes is better. <laughs> and um, people don't like Bayes because they don't like priors. But, but I like Bayes because I like priors, because priors gives you a lot of flexibility. And if you consider a setting like regression, I mean, there's a tremendous amount of, you know, small n, large p problems, a lot of variables, not much data, where you have, really have to have a prior distribution. And, uh, and Bayes formalizes that using sort of methods like ridge regression. And I'll say a little bit more about some of those methods later. So to me, uh, having a prior just makes things more flexible. If you, do, if, if you have enough data, then maximum likelihood is really large sample base. So, so, it, so to me, maximum likelihood is a part of base. And then the posterior distribution gives you estimates for uncertainty, and sometimes you can avoid having to invert an information matrix, which can be a pain. So that's an advantage too. Okay, so I'm gonna now talk a bit about complete case analysis, um, where you throw out the incomplete cases. So it's simple to do. You have to have you have to know which values are observed and which are missing. But aside from that, it's easy. Um, and when is that a good thing to do? Well, it tends to be. A, a, there's a lot of people who are down on it, complete case analysis in the literature, including myself to some degree. I have to confess. But there are some situations where complete case analysis is actually okay, and that is when there's not much information in the incomplete cases. I mean, the goal is to make up, is to use the information in the incomplete cases. If there's no information in the incomplete cases, there's no point in using it. Okay, so that's sort of the, the, the that's the question. Do we have information about what we're interested in in, in the incomplete cases? Um, well, it, that's a complicated question, I'm afraid. It depends on uh, how much a fraction of incomplete cases obviously has something to do with it. Um, what you have recorded in the incomplete cases matters. In particular, is it predictive of the thing that's missing, for example? And what are you estimating? So the loss of information is tricky to determine. And in general, you can statisticians use information matrix as a way of assessing this. But that's sort of a general approach. Um, but anyway, if there is information in incomplete cases, um, then, uh, um, then you, complete cases anal analysis might be biased or inefficient. Um, so I'm going to take an example, which I'm actually going to apply to WWC in a minute, but uh, so that I have a real application. But I suppose that y is an outcome is an outcome variable in a regression. X is, the x's are fully observed, and the y is missing. Now, if you're interested in the mean of y. If that's the target of inference, and if the x's are good predictors of y, say the r squared is like 0.8 or 0.9 or something, then there's a lot of information in incomplete cases. So this would be a setting where uh, complete, I wouldn't like complete cases because you can recover information from the incomplete cases. Um, on the other hand, if, if the, uh, let me go back a second. Uh, if, uh, if the x's are not strong predictors of y, then there's not much information in incomplete cases. So then dropping them wouldn't, wouldn't matter very much. On the other hand, if you're interested in the regression of y on the x's, so you're interested in the conditional mean of y given the x's, um, and assuming missing at random, 
There's no information in incomplete cases. So um, whether the predictors are strong or weak. So in that situation, every, every now and then you see people multiply imputing the y in that situation for the regression of y on the x's. If, 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 but there's no point in doing that. In fact, multiple imputation just to adding noise. It's not actually doing anything for you. You'd be better off just dropping and doing complete case analysis. Actually, for a missing not at random mechanism, you can use the incomplete cases, so that's, that's a little bit of a different situation. The, the WWC thing um, ha looks at a pattern like this uh, for what they call simple gain score analysis. So if you just have a, an outcome, you're looking at change from baseline, right? It's a gain score. Um, and uh, you have a dummy variable which indicates the treatment you're comparing, so the treatment conditions. And then X2 up to XP are baseline covariates. So then you get a pattern. If there's no missing data in, in the baseline variables, then you have this pattern. This I found a little puzzling, I have to say. The repeated measures analysis, maybe I should have Liz talk about this. The, the, the repeated measures analysis discussed in this section, simple gain scores, an analysis in which the dependent variable includes data from multiple time points, well, let's talk about the first case, simple gain score analysis, would rarely use regression adjustment or analysis of covariance to adjust for pre-intervention measure of outcome. Why? What do you think, Liz? I'm going to ask Liz Stewart this question. <laughs> adjustment. From a causal perspective, adjusting for base, baseline variables is the right thing to do. And um, because if it was an observational study, you can use it to reduce bias. If it's a randomized study, it can still improve precision. So I don't see why you wouldn't condition on it. So obviously, you're going to condition on the treatment indicator, but I think, I think you should also condition on the other x's. So I, I'm a little bit puzzled by that, by that statement. OK, all but one of the acceptable approaches in, in the table, these, the, these acceptable approaches, can provide unbiased estimates of effectiveness of an intervention based on missing at random. They then, it's not what, quite exactly what they said, but they, it was basically, in effect, missing at random. The exception is complete case analysis, which requires a more restrictive assumption that missing data also does not depend on the, mis on the measured factors. So it's widely considered, thought of, that complete case analysis assumes missing completely at random. The missingness doesn't depend on observed or unobserved variables. Um, that's not true in general. Um, in regression, complete case analysis, at least if you're conditioning on the x's, which is what I would do, um, doesn't assume missing completely at random, but it does assume missingness depends on the covariates. Um, in fact, if the covariates have missing values, it's, it's valid for a missing not at random mechanism because missingness can depend on missing covariates. But it's not allowed to depend on the outcome. So um, complete case analysis may be less biased than imputation based on missing at random if missingness depends on the covariates. So this is sort of the dilemma of missing data thing. You have to make an assumption. Depending on the assumption, one method might work or the other method might work. And often you don't know which assumption is correct. So this is sort of tricky. But uh, anyway, it's interesting that uh, uh, if missing this really depends on, on the covariates, and if you think in your setting, there might well be situations where missing this might depend on the baseline covariates, but less well on the outcomes. In that case, uh, you might wonder whether you want to assume missing at random. <clears throat> now, WWC re relies heavily on baseline equivalence um, in assessing uh, the potential for bias. Um, what, what's baseline equivalence? Well, what does the distribution of the x's look for, across the treatments? Which is a reasonable thing to do, by the way. I'm not against looking at that. I think that's important. Um, but on the other hand, it's a little bit limited. What really matters is, is whether the distribution of the outcomes 
are different across treatment groups after adjusting for the, for the, for the covariates. That's what we're really interested in. But trouble is we don't really know, so, so we're a little bit stuck. Um, but there's one odd thing about this. WWC gives credit to imputation of the outcome for improving baseline equivalence by including the imputed cases in comparisons of the distribution of the x's across the treatments. So if you impute the missing values of y, then you can compare the distribution of the x's across the treatment groups, including the imputed data. And that might make things look better. But if you're, if you're conditioning on the x's, which is what I think you should be doing, um, this is not, this is, this is, doesn't make any sense. Because complete case analysis is exactly the same as imputing on y. So if it's the same method, how can you get credit for it when you're doing the baseline and balance? So this doesn't look quite right to me either. So they may have been considering the situation where you're, condition, you're not conditioning on the other x's, but I, I think that's the wrong thing to do. <clears throat> so when is imputation? So the thing is that complete case analysis is not quite as bad as it's sometimes made out to be, I think. But uh, when is it useful? Imputation of an outcome is justified when there are auxiliary variables, um, those are variables that are not included in the final analysis that are predictive of the outcome if you're dealing with outcome imputation. Um, and that would be the case if you had repeated measures data where you had a, an intermediate variable that was more observed that's predictive of what happens at the end. In that case, there is information in the incomplete cases. Um, and in that case, imputation does make sense. Or, or doing a maximum likelihood method would make sense in that setting. <clears throat> so uh, I also think that for missing not at random methods, um, imputation can play a useful role, particularly multiple imputation. And, and uh, WWC uses proxy pattern mixture analysis, which I'll talk about later. Actually, if you have missing data in the X's, not in Y, there's, th 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 those cases can be quite a lot of can, can provide quite a lot of information, particularly if they're X's other than the treatment indicator that have missing values. And if you don't have the treatment indicator, if you don't know which treatment you're getting, that's not much information in that case. But if you have other covariates that are missing, but you know the treatment indicator, you can get a lot of information. Um, so if you have a lot of data that's missing, that's scattered over the data set. That's the sort of situation where imputation can be really useful. Okay, I, I probably should skip over this fairly quickly, but there's weight in analysis. So unit non-response in surveys often does weighting. So you weight by the inverse, weight cases by the inverse of their estimated probability of response. This is a bit like weighting by the inverse of their selection probability, which is what we do in surveys. So it's sort of anal analogous to, to survey weights, if you like. Um, there are two sort of principal ways of dealing with estimating the weights. There's adjustment cell weighting, where you throw respondents and non-respondents into cells that are based on variables that are fully observed, and then weight by the inverse of the response rate within the cell or response propensity weighting, which is uh, doing a logistic regression on the observed covariates on the indicator for missingness, the M, and then weighting by the inverse of the estimated propensity to respond. That's more general than the adjustment cell weighting. The one thing I want to say about weighting is that it, it really needs observed covariates that are predictive of the thing you're in, that's missing. If you don't have variables that are predictive, then the method doesn't help you very much. And in fact, it can hurt you. If they're strongly related to missingness, but they're not related to why, they just add noise. And the problem is that in unit, in unit non-response in surveys, often the covariates are not very predictive of what we're interested in. So I think in a lot of situations, actually non-response weighting might make things worse. So it's not, uh, to my mind, necessarily going to be better. It's potentially inefficient and may not improve the estimates if missingness depends on covariates with missing values, 
wagered complete cases can be more biased than unwagered complete case analysis. So this a lot of people don't know. Waging can make things worse. So I'm sorry. I have a lot of bad news here. <laughs> and then there's extensions. So non-response weights can uh, include information from external data. That's a, a very use, useful way of doing uh, of using external data, post-stratification in the survey world, or raking if you have a bunch of them. <clears throat> and then there's augmented inverse probability waging, AIPW, I'm calling it here, that uh, combines prediction of the missing values with weighting of the residuals. And uh, that has a, uh, has a, is more efficient than just doing weighting, and it has some kind of a robustness property, which I won't go into here. Weighting is not very good for a general pattern of missing data. It doesn't really handle a general pattern very well. Item non-response, for example, where you have the Swiss cheese pattern, I think imputation is a better method. Then there's multiple imputation. So create multiple data sets with different draws for the predictive distribution of the missing values filled in. Um, and then you, you get a different bunch of different data sets with different imputations for the missing values that are draws. And then you combine the inference using these multiple imputation combining rules, which I haven't put up here, but are very straightforward. Um, so multiple imputation propagates imputation uncertainty. And averaging the estimates also improves the efficiency. You might think that doing a draw is a relatively inefficient thing to do. But then if you average over the data sets, that gets rid of the inefficiency. So in fact, this is sort of Bayes, a, a, a Bayes simulation approximation. <clears throat> One of the nice things about multiple imputation is that you can include variables in the uh, imputation model that you're not going to include in the final analysis model. So I like that additional flexibility. If you do everything on the same model, then you can't include variables that are not in the analysis model. But this is, uh, uh, can be very useful. And there's a lot of software for doing multiple imputation these days. So uh, you don't have to write your own software. There are three main approaches for creating multiple imputations. There's uh, modeling the joint distribution of, of the variables. Um, there's a hot deck imputation where you, uh, you basically match a, a non-respondent to a donor and then use the donor's value plug, plug, plugging them in. I have a review paper with, my, uh, with Rebecca Andrich on that if you're interested in that method. Um, there's a metric which you're using to match the, the donors and the recipients, as we call them. And uh, there's a variety of metrics, but uh, the predictive mean matching metric is to me the right metric, for those of you who are interested. I'm not going to go into any more detail. I don't have time. But, um, and there's software for doing that. So SAS, for example, has a predictive mean metric. <clears throat> and then there's sequential regression or chained equation imputation which is what I mentioned earlier. So um, what does that do? Well, it's sort of like a Gibbs sample, for those of you who know what the Gibbs sample. You take one variable at a time, you regress that variable on all the other variables, and then fill in that variable, and then you go to the next variable, and then you fill in the missing values for that variable using the imputations you, you just done for the first variable. So you keep on one, one variable at a time, filling in based on the conditional distribution of that variable given all the other variables. And then you iterate. That's kind of what we do with the Gibbs sampler, actually. In fact, this is a Gibbs sampler for some models. This is a nice method because it's very flexible. So if you have a binary with missing variables, then you can do a logistic regression. Or if you have count data, you can use a Poisson regression. Or if you like a non-parametric type of regression, you can do that. So there's, because it's a set of univariate regressions, you have a lot of flexibility. Um, it's, it, technically, it doesn't correspond to any joint distribution, so it's not quite kosher from a theoretical point of view. But to me, the flexibility of this method outweighs the fact that it's not quite sort of kosher from a theoretical point of view. And, and if you pay some attention to, to each of these, these, these regression models, then uh, the method will work pretty well. I think, and better than, a, than a, a method based on a joint model that's too restrictive. I mean, a multivariate normal model is a lovely model. It's a very restrictive model, right? It assumes everything's linear and additive on all the other variables and so on. 
and it can deal with perhaps bounds and restrictions on the parameters and so on. So I like this method a lot, and if you have a general pattern of missing data, then I, I, I would recommend it, and there's quite a bit of software. You know, um, the uh, mice, for example, some of you probably know mice. That's one of the, the chained equation methods. Um, I just want to mention uh, a, an alternative that I, I've sort of worked on to um, uh, asymptotic inverse probability weighting that uses the weight, but uh, this calculates the propensity to be missing that, 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 that formed the weight before, but then does a regression on the spline of the propensity, which is a, a flexible function of the propensity, plus other covariates to increase prediction. Um, and uh, I'm not going to go into much detail here, but, but the advantage of, of this method is that it has a, also has a kind of a double robustness property. So it's kind of robust, and um, it tends to be more efficient than AIPT, than augmented inverse probability weighting when the weights are very variable, because you don't have to weight. So you, you're avoiding the weights. And it's really just a regression method, but you're using the propensity as one of the covariates, basically. Another sort of form of flexible imputation is, uh, is to do things like uh, add a prior distribution to the regressions. So, uh, um, you know, if you have small n, large p problems, you have a lot of covariates, you don't have much data. These squares is known to me not very good, um, but then methods that effectively add a prior distribution like ridge regression, the lasso elastic net, uh, the, the first paper here, which I love, by Dempster, uh, Dempster and uh, Sutakara, Dem Dempster, Sutakara, and Verma, I've forgotten the name, it's in the back. It's called the 57 Varieties paper because they compare 57 varieties of regression. And, and, and that was a long time ago, so now there's probably 157 varieties of regression. So, so there's a lot of flexibility for handling, adding prior distributions that I think can improve the predictions for multiple imputation. Or you can do tree-based methods uh, like BART, Bayesian additive regression trees. And, uh, and, and so there's a lot of more sort of modern regression methods that can be applied to give you more flexible methods for handling multiple imputation. Okay, so the, the last thing I'm gonna talk about is missing not at random. Um, my book with Ruben, we, we, we did quite a lot of changes to the last chapter, which was on missing not at random. And uh, it's basically a problem because most missing not at random models are, are, are on, and you can't estimate all the parameters. It's sort, of, it's sort of related to the fact that you can't test missing at random as you can't really estimate the parameters in missing not at random models very well. So you're a little bit stuck. Um, here are possibilities, I think. One is to follow up a sample of non-respondents and incorporate into the analysis. Um, you can impose restrictions on the model parameters, the model for M or the model for D, um, and that will identify the model. So the Heckman model in econometrics, which a lot of people have heard of, um, it really only works if you have these regression restrictions. Otherwise, I, I think it's, it's uh, dicey. Um, graphical displays like uh, graphical models can be, uh, for some people find that useful for, for displaying the restrictions in the model. The trouble is that results tend to be very sensitive to violations of the assumptions. So selectively discarding data on missing at random assumptions is a, is a specialized method that I'm not gonna talk about here. Um, the method that, that, that I think is worth considering in a lot of settings is really to do a sensitivity analysis where you look at how much results change when you look at deviation from missing at random. And uh, in the clinic, clinical trial area, this is now being used a lot, I think, in uh, handling missing data in clinical trials. Now, WWC actually uh, does use a, a, a multiple imputation sensitivity analysis using something called proxy pattern mixture analysis. And uh, I just want to say briefly what that is. And this is probably one slide. We're getting very close to happy hour, so you can basically just fall asleep if you don't like any equations. <laughs> Um, but then we have, a, pro we have a, a single variable Y that's missing. We have a bunch of Zs uh, that are fully observed. So the Xs have become Zs in this, in this picture. Um, so uh, um, the goal is to do, adjust, say, the mean of Y. We actually have methods also handle regressions. 
Um, but look at deviations from missing at random. And, and the idea here is, um, is you get the, what's called a proxy variable. The proxy variable is basically the best predictor of Y based on the, on the Zs. So you do a regression of Y on the Zs using the complete cases, you get a best prediction, then you can scale it to have the same variance as Y, and I call that the proxy. So it's the best you can do for predicting Y based on the Zs you've got. And uh, so I could call that a strong proxy if the correlation between Y and the best predictor is high, but it's a weak proxy if the correlation is low. The, the correlation is really the R squared. I mean, rho squared is the R squared. So you, you can then replace the, the set of Zs by a single variable, which is this proxy variable, and um, then uh, do an analysis that assumes a different normal distribution for X and Y, the best proxy in the outcome, um, that has a different distribution, normal distribution in the, in the response for the respondents and non-respondents. So the superscript M here means that the distribution is different for respondents and non-respondents. But then you make an assumption that missingness depends on a, uh, is just a function of Y star, or it can also depend on other variables B, but main thing it depends on Y star, which is a linear combination of the proxy and Y. And uh, let me go back for a second. I'm sure you're totally enthralled by this. So. So if phi is equal to zero, then missingness only depends on the proxy, and that's missing at random. If phi is equal to one, missingness doesn't depend on the proxy, but it depends totally on y, which is missing. So the idea is to, this phi parameter, it's just to vary this phi parameter to look at deviation from missing at random. Um, so um, the nice thing about this, this is like a complicated equation, but the, the estimates you get from this are actually very straightforward. They're just extensions of the regression estimator, but where the coefficient depends on phi. And in particular, when phi is equal to zero, you just get the usual regression estimator. When phi is equal to one here, you, you get a method that takes the bias estimated from the proxy and plugs that in for, the, for, for y. And then if phi is equal to one, you get something called the inverse regression estimator. So, you don't have to worry about the, 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 the details here. The thing is, this is very straightforward um, for equations. It's a little bit like the Heckman approach, but the Heckman approach is much more complicated, really, I think. Um, so the idea is to vary um, these three values of phi to look at sensitivity. And this is actually, I think, what WWC does um, when they're assessing sensitivity. So it's nice of them to, to, to use my method. So. With, with Rebecca's. Um, it, I think they do it conditionally on, on separately on each treatment group, which gives you two sensitivity parameters, which probably makes, make, makes sense, actually. <clears throat> and then you can do maximum likelihood Bayes or multiple imputation based on this idea, and they all have pluses and minuses. Um, so why do I like this method? Um, essentially, when, when are you in a good situation for, for, for missing data? If you have good predictors of Y and the distribution of that good predictor looks similar for respondents and non-respondents, that's, that's a favorable situation. And this is a, that's a situation where results are relatively insensitive. On the other hand, if you have weak predictors or if the distribution of X is really different between respondents and non-respondents, then, uh, then you get more sensitivity. It also depends on how much missing data you've got, which is also sensible. So it sort of combines the different elements in the right way, from my point of view. It does reinforce the fact that you need good predictors of the missing values to make a lot of progress. So I think that's, again, the important feature. Um, it has limitations. And um, of course, I'm not going to talk about the limitations of the method because I, I, I suggested the method, which I think is wonderful. No, not really. It, there, there's no method that works for everything. <laughs> it's basically the bottom line. So there are assumptions in this method. And although it goes beyond missing at random, which I think is positive, 
Um, it doesn't cover all possible missing off at random mechanisms because there's no method that does that. Actually, the only method that might arguably does that is Mansky bound. Some of you might know Mansky's method, but that's too conservative to be ever useful, in my view. So it's, it's, it's in principle the right thing to do, but it doesn't work very well. Okay, so th I think this is my last slide. So I, I'm sorry to paint such a complicated picture, but the best approach of all is not to have missing data. <laughs> and uh, so there, I was on a National Academies study that looked at missing data in clinical trials. And uh, this was in some senses perhaps the most useful thing that came from this study because people who are doing clinical trials now pay much more attention to missing data. If you pay attention to it, and try to reduce how much missing data you've got and, f and, f and follow up the, the sites that are doing a bad job and sort of just check on it and then don't have too much information, don't have two hour questionnaires that people don't want to answer, right? And, uh, and answer, ask questions that people can answer. There are trade offs in all these kinds of things, but uh, having less missing data is, is a good idea because statisticians are really not going to be able to solve this problem. I'm sorry. I mean, we're very smart, and Larry here is particularly smart, but uh, you, know, you have to make assumptions. And if you're in a clinical trial world, people hate assumptions. I mean, maybe in the education world, it's not quite so bad. But... Anyway, there's a lot of advice about how to uh, reduce missing data um, in, in the two references I give there. Um, okay, I have a couple of slides with conclusions. Um, I also, there's a paper by Lee et al. that I want to co-author on that also talks about uh, um, guidelines for how to deal with missing data. So I have two slides on this and I'm done. So, so complete case or inverse probability weighting or a method that fill, uses all the data, such as maximum likelihood or Bayes or multiple imputation. Complete case analysis or weighting is adequate if the information in the incomplete cases is minimal for the parameters of interest. Weighting the complete cases is indicated when you have good auxiliary variables that are predictive of the variable that's missing. Then if you're filling in um, all the, using all the data, what about maximum likelihood days or multiple imputation? Well, it depends a little bit on what you know and what you have available. Maximum likelihood under missing at random is okay if you have a large sample size. If missing at random is viewed as plausible, and if model checks don't raise red flags. Actually, another thing that, about WWC thing, which I think is interesting, is there are a lot of conditions if you do imputation. But complete case analysis, you get away, away with scot-free, basically. <laughs> I can sort of understand why, but it's not true. Complete case analysis makes assumptions as well. So. And then uh, maximum likelihood assuming, okay, so then Bayes is better if you have if prior distributions can help you, as in the large, large, large p small n type problems, and uh, um, or if you don't have much data, sample size is small, um, and then multiple imputation it has this flexibility of allowing the imputation model and analysis model to differ, um, and I like this chained equation approach um, because of its flexibility. Um, finally, missing at random or missing not at random. Missing at random might be best if you have good auxiliary variables um, that are predictive of the missing variables, um, particularly if the distribution of those variables is balanced between the treatment groups. Um, Contilla missing not at random if missingness depends on variables that are missing, that is, if it's missing not at random. <laughs> if uh, there's limited information about missingness, if the fraction of missing information is high. Um, Fitting a missing not at random may be reasonable if assumptions needed to identify the model are justified. But to my mind, most of the settings of like the Heckman model, I don't believe the assumptions. There are some exceptions. I have a couple of examples in my book um, with Rubin, one of which is, a, to my mind, an a successful use of the Heckman model. You have to have instrumental variables for those of you who are more economists. Um, but if you don't have that, then I think a sensitivity analysis is indicated. Um, and uh, um, 
this subsampling normal idea is quite an interesting idea, but I don't really have time to talk about it. So. Okay, so thank you very much. I've probably gone on too long. I'm done. I have a bunch of references. Also, if, I, if I go on too long, you can't ask me too many difficult questions, right, Beth? <laughs> Mic is on. Hello? Can you hear me? Okay. Um, indeed, you went on long enough that there's not a lot of time for questions, but um, I think that might be okay because that was kind of like a master class in um, missing data. I, I'm actually very excited to have these slides and to integrate them into my advanced progression class. Um, and I imagine many of you are interested in these slides as well, so we will, hopefully you you don't mind sharing. Sure, I will make it available. Uh, um, and the WWC can thank us for the free consulting when in any way. I'll, I'll be sending uh, the bill. So. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> um, I really appreciated, actually, that you sort of emphasized design at the end. I feel like that's kind of the answer that all statisticians give, right? Like, we end everything with, it's all about the design, it's not about the analysis, Design better. Yeah. Um, Howard Bloom, I think, said in a talk here a few years ago, "Design, design, design," and that was kind of um, the the, t the take home. Um, so I, I think that's, that's the take home here as well. Um, so maybe we will not take questions actually, and we will allow people to accost you during the okay. um, the the wine party the afterwards hour. if they have any burning missing data questions. Um, so please join me in a final round of applause.